Okay, let's, uh, let's talk briefly about particle acceleration and electron volts. My pen will write. Please write pen. All right, take it. Particle acceleration and the E, 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 e K, which is the electron volt. Okay, so let's just quickly recap uh, electric fields. So let's imagine that we have a object, and this object is charged positively. Okay, so we would say this electric field points outward like this. Why would we say that again? How do we measure an electric field? With the what type of charge? What type of test charge? Right, so I take my positive test charge, and wherever I place it in this field, the force points away, okay? So that's what these lines are showing you. No matter where I place it, these lines point away. And what happens to the amount of force on a given test charge as I move away? And it gets less and less how? Right, the classic inverse square relationship. Okay, so force decreases as we move away. Um, how do we measure the charge on this central object? What units do we use? Coulombs, so Q. Okay, so we have that, and we measure the strength of the field at you know a given point, either here or here or here or wherever we measure it. Um, and the way we write that is F for Q. In other words, how much force we have in newtons. Right. for every, you know, amount of charge we have uh, in our test charge, so for Coulomb. And therefore, our units are Newton per Coulomb, right? So let's just quickly, while we're at it here, take this and rearrange it, okay? We call this F sub E, force from the electric field, or force from the repulsion. Um, and by the way, right, uh, if you switch this to a negative test charge, it, all that happens is the force switches direction and aims towards that, that central charge. Exactly, yeah, and it just switches direction. You wouldn't even do anything with your numbers. You would just realize that a negative charge would be attractive versus repelled, right? Um, you don't put a negative or a positive into your formula. So rearranging, you get this, Fe equals Q times the field strength. So if E the field strength, you know, is 5 newtons per coulomb, and you put a 1 coulomb charge in there, and you get a 5 newton force, right? Um, that'd be an incredibly weak field, but that's how that goes. Okay. Now, we also learned Coulomb's law. Did we not? And Coulomb's law says this. Fe equals K, Coulomb's constant, Q, Q, over R squared. So we can look at the force on this charge, right, on this test charge, in two ways. We can look at it in terms of Coulomb's, you know, um, universal law, or we can look at it in terms of how much force it's getting from a known electric field, all right? And what we can do with that is we can make those equal. Okay, so you'll see here that little q, the size of this test charge, is on each of them. And therefore, we can cancel that out. So we get this handy little formula working itself out here, which says that the field strength at some distance r, right, from a known amount of charge, all right, will be found via this little formula. Okay, so this is a way to find the field strength over here. Does that make sense? Okay, awesome. All right. Then we talked about how if, you know, say I were to take my positive charge and 
move it to here, right? That would require work, right? I'd have to put a force on it. It'd have to happen over a distance. The thing is that, you know, this is on an inverse square law, so the amount of force I need to apply grows, all right? But what we're sort of interested in, really, is just the difference between these two points, right? The difference between these two points. And how we would measure that is how many joules of work it took to move from point A to point B. Okay, and if we put that much work in, then conservation of energy says, if I allow this to move back, it should, exactly, it should release that same amount of energy. Okay, so we call that, that a volt, right? Just how many joules per coulomb we get or are forced to give in moving from one point to another, okay? So voltage can only be measured between two different points in an electric field, all right? So that's our definition of voltage, and we're sort of building up some new things. Now, this is, this formula is really only useful um, in this scenario where we're moving in sort of a circular uh, electric field back and forth, or sorry, we're finding the field strength around a circular or around a point charge or a set of charges, okay? Um, if we had two charges here, you'd have to find, and you wanted to know a point like over here, you'd have to find, um, you know, the electric field based on each one, and you'd have to combine them together as vectors. You're not going to be required to do that, but if you had to, that's, uh, that's how that would work. Okay. Now, moving on a little bit, it changes when we switch to a parallel plate system, which I don't know if we've talked about it all yet. But um, some things become, I think, a little more clear. We start to consider what happens if we were to do this. So let's say we create two parallel plates and we give them some charge. And one way to uh, charge them up, and we'll say that there's a insulation in here, right? Either it's air or it's... Uh, you know, some kind of plastic or something like that, right? There's an insulator here, so we're not allowing charge to flow through it. You can actually set something like this up. The cell. Like that. Okay. I'm not sure if we know this symbol, but basically it just represents like a battery. Um, yeah, this is a capacitor. You're right. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. Um, this would just be an air... I don't know what you call it, like air core, air gapped capacitor. Normally they would have like a dielectric material and normally, you, essentially you would take this the concept, you use flexible um, metal here and you'd put uh, some kind of like cellophane or plastic in here and you'd roll it up. And that's why they look like little cans, right? If you've ever seen a capacitor, it looks like a little, a little can like this. And inside, essentially you have, imagine, you know, two strips of tin foil laid on top of each other, but sandwiched between them is a piece of plastic. Right, right, that's got a, um, you know, a, a, a very high resistance, right, or a, a, you want a, a high permittivity, right, like something that is, uh, shoot, should I say that? Yeah, yeah, that's okay to say, yeah, never mind. That's not what we're talking about right now anyway, but, um, and capacitors really and capacitance and all that isn't really part of this course. But yeah, you've recognized that that's a capacitor. Um, what we're more interested in though is the behavior of stuff in here. If we say we're to maybe make this into a vacuum, because once you make it into a vacuum, particles could move between points, right? Um, so the first thing that we should talk about is what the field looks like in here, okay? So if we take our positive test charge and we place it inside that field, no matter what, you're going to get this. Uh, no, you're not. You're going to get this. <laughs> there we go. So the field is uniform inside the parallel plate system. Okay? And those are meant to all be just, like, exactly evenly spaced. And you would get, like, a little bit of, you know, um, bulge or whatever at the ends in terms of what the field looks like. So like that. Um, okay. So there we go. Now what we're going to do is we're going to imagine that we take some amount of charge here. Alright. And we move it to here. Okay. Now we're sort of leaving out exactly what's in the middle here. But 
let's just say that what's in the middle is, is vacuum now, okay? And we're going to say that none of the material that's here or here can actually move, so only what we put inside this is going to be able to move, okay? So we've got, you know, our field here, we're going to allow or put stuff in here and make it move. So if I can move this from there to there, right, I have to do work. But now because I'm not moving in a, in a field that's changing at a squared distance, right, now I'm in a constant field, um, we could do a little bit maybe easier math with this, right? So what's important here are a couple of things. One thing that's important is how far away these things are from each other, right? Um, well, R doesn't really play a role in this, right? Because R is talking more about like a radial distance away, like a radius away. So we're not talking about circular stuff, so the concept of R doesn't really apply. But what does apply, right? Let's put, uh, let's give this a voltage. Let's call this 12 volts, just because 12 volts. So the first question is, if this is a coulomb, how much energy does it take to move it from here to here? So, can you tell me? How much energy, how much work do I have to do? Right? How much work do I have to do? I should say work work, because i got to be, be applying a force, right? So I want to know the amount of work to move, or to push this from this plate to this plate. So how much is it? Can you tell from the information I gave you? Look, where my cursor is. What does 12 volts mean? So then can you answer my question? How much work to move one coulomb from plus to negative plate? 12 joules of work. Good. Okay. Now our definition of work, right, is uh, work is equal to the force I need to apply. In here, no matter where I put my negative charge, it experiences the same force because the field is uniform. So Fe is the, the force that it's experiencing inside the field times D, the distance that I have to push it. Right? Okay. Perfect. Now we can sort of like we could do some rearranging if we want, right? We could say why can't we say this? Could we say that uh, we could say that F E is equal to work for distance? Could we not? Can we say that? Okay. And we can also look at this in a different way, right? We could say that the force on here, the force that this feels in the field, right, it should be equal to the amount of charge, Q, times the strength of the electric field. Can we not? Okay, so the force this experiences is equal to Q, the amount of charge, times E. Remember, E is measured in newtons per coulomb. Q is measured in Coulomb, so it's just a straight-up multiplication. So look, we can look at this force in two different ways. So we could say then that QE equals W over D. QE, the force on that object, uh, charge times field strength, is equal to the work over the distance. So far, so good? Or we could rearrange and we could say the work is equal to Q times E times D. Or electric potential energy equals Q times field strength times D. So what does that mean again? Well, it just means if we know the field strength and we know the distance and we know the charge, right? The kind of work we have to do to move from, from one side to the other um, can be sorted, right? The amount of energy that it has potentially when it's over here is equal to those three uh, variables multiplied together. Okay, now let's continue with a little more fun deriving here. We also know um, back from here, right, um, that 
the amount of energy can also be found as the voltage multiplied by the charge, right? This is joules per coulomb. This is the amount of charge in coulombs, right? So we know that for every coulomb of charge that we allow to move from here to here, we can pull 12 joules out of, or if we want to move charge from here to here, okay, that we have to put 12 joules in. So now we also have something else we could say. We can make this equal to V times Q. So we could say V Q equals Q, yeah. Q goes away. We could say this the voltage is equal to the field times the distance. Aha! That's interesting. So we've just sort of figured out a new way to talk about um, voltage, right? Or maybe a better way to say this is what happens to the field if we change the distance between the um, plates. So let's just imagine. I'll draw two systems and we'll see what it means. This is meant to be twice as far away. We'll just talk about it in terms of, of what it means with energy. Okay? So we'll do this. Draw our field in here. Here. I don't know if I'm. Don't worry about the number of. <laughs> don't worry about the number of uh, of arrows right now. I, uh, I should have been a little more careful, but I wasn't. So don't worry about that. What we'll say is we've got 12 volts on each of these. Where is the field going to be stronger? Actually, I'm going to try to trick you. So we've got positives up here, right? <laughs> Negatives down here. I'm going to take a known amount of charge. Let's say it's a one Coulomb test charge, and I'm going to plop it in here. Okay? I'm going to plop this in here. In which case does it take more work to move this around from one plate to the other or where does it have more potential energy let's say that we're moving it this way okay from plate to plate all right we're moving it against the the potential here we're pushing it up where is more work required to do this a yes exactly same amount of work close. So what does that mean, right? Well, we're almost there. E, E, potential, must be equal to Fe times D, right? Uh, so electrical potential has to be equal to force times distance. We know that for a given amount of charge, right, which we're saying this is the same amount of charge, we're saying that the amount of work we put in has to be the same. So what does that tell you about the amount of force required? Where is the force required to move this higher? Is it in A or is it in B? Where would force have to be higher if we know that EE is the same in both scenarios because we're using the same amount of charge? A, right, the force must be higher. So what does that tell you about the field then? Stronger field when you have a shorter distance, okay? Stronger field when you have a shorter distance. Um, and, you know, you can look at it from here, right? Distance goes down, charge is kept the same, field must go up, right? Field strength must go up. And it goes up linearly, right? So if we have twice the distance, then we have half the field strength. Does that make sense? So since work equals force times distance, you know, we could spread this apart farther. We know from the 12 volts that we've put across here that the amount of work can't change. So what has to happen is if the force drops, the distance must be greater. 
okay? Or in other words, the field must be weaker over here. Does that make sense? Okay, sweet. So now what the heck could we possibly, I mean, this has uses. This has uses as a capacitor. It also has uses in terms of an energy transfer system. So let's imagine we have this. Let's say that we made a long tube here. Let's make a long tube. So here it is. Okay. And let's say at one end of the tube, we put a, I don't know, let's make it positive. It's a po big positive place plate here. Okay. Now let's say over here, put a negative plate. But one thing we're going to add over here is we're actually going to bore a little hole right in the end of this. So let's say we put a little hole right here. And what we're going to do, we're going to make ourselves a little, like, beam gun here. <laughs> so let's imagine, then, that we connect this to, like, a massive voltage, right? A massive potential. Are you with me? And then we evacuate this tube. Put vacuum in there. And then let's say we inject some stuff into here. Okay? Don't ask me how we're... Ah, some stuff. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, the peanut gallery didn't like stuff. Ionized particles. There, how about that? Or even electrons. It doesn't matter. Something with a negative charge some small particles with a negative charge, okay? So we release them into here. Okay, little light, little particles. We've ionized them. They're negatively charged. Well, what do you think is going to happen to them? Let's say this is like, and we're going we're gonna to deal in volts first, and then we'll talk about electron volts after. I don't know. Let's say that this is uh, one gigavolt. All right, are you with me? One gigavolt. And let's say we fire a little particle in here. Uh, let's say it's a, a negatively charged, um, I don't know what, something that we could negatively charge. Let's say it's a fluoride ion or something. I don't know. And what's going to happen to it? Does it have potential when it's over here? Does it have a potential when it's over here? It's negatively charged near the negative plate in one gigavolt of evacuated space? Oh, it's got a lot of potential, doesn't it? It's got, the whole system has a gigavolt of potential. Um, you know, so if there's one charge on here, there's one extra electron on here, how many coulombs would we have of extra charge on here? Because that's important, right? Yeah. Sure. So... What we could measure then is we could actually probably measure how much energy this particle could have, right, based on this concept. If we know that it has one extra electron on it, right, we could say then that the amount of energy, since energy should be equal to V times Q, well, the Q is just the amount of Q on one extra electron, we could say 1 times 10 to the 9 joules per coulomb times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, squeeze it on there, equals how much potential energy? Math it. Did you do that? 1.6 times 10 to the negative 10 joules. Perfect. Now I'm going to let this thing go. Right? We're going to release it. What will happen to it? Yeah, it'll shoot across, right? There's, this is vacuum. It'll zip across. And let's say we, like, let's say we put, like, a whole bunch of these in here. We just keep, like, shooting them in. Well, what they're going to do is they're going to come flinging across here at massive velocities, and they're going to smash into the, into the positive plate. But some of them, right, are going to come out of our tube, and they're going to, you know, we say put a target here of some sort, they're going to like smash into that target at super high velocities. OK, 
can I calculate what that velocity would be? How? What's going on here? I'm turning electric potential energy into what kind of potential energy? Or what type of energy? Good. So we're saying we're going from, and this should be little e. Don't get this confused with electric field, okay? Um, I've got to be careful with that. Actually, I think they, I think we do this, don't we? Um, oh, no, no. Never mind. We don't. Never mind. It doesn't matter. Okay? So we're saying we're turning electric potential, and it's going to convert into EK. Right? So then we could say here, right, VQ must become one-half MV squared. Aha! So if we know the mass of a fluoride ion, and we know that's in a giga volt of potential, and we release it, we should be able to tell then how fast it's going to smash out of the end of this thing, right? Um, does this seem like a lot of energy? Not really. But if it's all on a tiny little particle, that could translate into some very high speeds, okay? So let's see what we get. Um, let's see here. 2VQ over M root. Uh, oh, yeah, and we got to be careful too, right? That's big B. <laughs> velocity and little velocity, right? Just got to be careful of which one we're talking about. All right, so we said 2 times, um, what was it, 1 gigavolt that we said? Okay. So 1 times 10 to the 9 volts times Q. Actually, I sort of already figured this out, but... Um, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs divided by, well, the one missing piece is the mass of a fluoride. So let's find that. So instead of cheating and just Googling what the mass is, let's bring in some uh, periodic table here. So that's 19 grams per mole. Point oh two times ten to the twenty three of these things weighs nineteen grams. Mm hmm Right. So could we just say, um, let's see here. Can we go like this? Uh mass equals nineteen over six point oh two times ten to the twenty three and divide that into there. So we could just multiply them together, couldn't we? down here uh, right well whatever let's just let's just do the math separately and put it in here instead of trying to be fancy pants so what number do you get for this someone got a math number for me here There we go. And that's grams, right? So can I use grams in this formula? No, I gotta go MKS, right? Right. Sort of the negative uh no, I gotta add. So it should be to the negative twenty-six in terms of kilograms, right? The other thing we could have done here, just just FYI, right, is we could have gone 2V Q times um, Avogadro's number up here. What's the symbol for moles? Is it little m? Okay, so that that's moles. And then on the bottom... Um, Yeah, you'd go, this would be mass, uh, atomic mass, divided by 10 to the 3. Okay, not that you're ever going to have to do that, you can just do it like this. Um, but let's work out what velocity we get at the end. Someone got that number for me? So, interestingly, and this is just by a pure accident, 
times 10 to the 8, oh no, never mind. Forget what I was going to say, meters per second. Is that above or below the speed of light? Below, right? 3.0 times 10 to the 8 meters per second is the speed of light. Now, yeah, right. Is it, do you think, this is just an aside, that it's realistic that you could get something as massive as a fluoride ion to go this fast? What if we were to change it from a fluoride ion to an electron? Well, this number would get much, much smaller, and this number would exceed the speed of light. But is that possible? No. <laughs> so, just FYI, in real life, you cannot, and you know this, get something to go faster than the speed of light. Even if the math says you can, you can't. So you get into relativistic physics at that point, all right? where stuff gets a bit trickier, and essentially what goes on is the faster these, th these things go, the more massive they become, therefore preventing you from sending mass at or beyond the speed of light. Even if the straightforward math says it would happen, you have to use relativistic math, math which corrects for that and prevents you from going faster than the speed of light. Um, so anyway, whatever, we're not digging into... Einstein's stuff. Um, I'll leave that for a future teacher to deal with with you guys. Uh, but this is essentially a linear particle accelerator, right? And basically, you scale this up, you scale the energies up, um, you know, and, and really there's probably no physical limit to how high energy you could get. It's just whether the tech, we have the technology to do so. Um, um, and, you know, something like uh, the Large Hadron Collider is now you take this put it into a circle and you give these things kicks and they spin around faster and faster and faster until you've got particles going at like close to the speed of light um, and it takes a lot more energy than you would think to do so. So all this being said, you do not look at a website of a particle accelerator and see gigavolts. You see it in terms of electron volts. Okay, So an electron volt is actually, we actually kind of touched on it earlier, the electron volt is not a measure of potential, it's a measure of energy directly, okay? The electron volt is a measure of energy. Ah, I shouldn't say that. It is, a measure. it is a measure of potential. Okay, so what is it? One electron volt it is found is equal to the energy required to move one electron through a one volt potential. That's all it is. So let's draw this so we understand it. Um, one volt potential, yeah, sorry, my writing's been writing for half an hour here. It's starting to fall apart. It's not one joule. Be careful. One volt is one joule per coulomb. We're not talking about a coulomb. We're just talking about a single one. Exactly. Yeah, it is. Okay. So here's one electron. Q equals 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, right? E, amount of energy, is equal to V times Q. Okay, so if this is one volt, this is one electron, the amount of energy here of an electron volt, right? So one volt, one electron, should be one uh, joule per coulomb times the elementary charge, right? So this is the elementary charge here, aka little e, so little e. 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. That crosses off. 1 EV, again, is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. So not very much. So, what number did you guys have for the Large Hadron Collider? Uh, 
but Terra is irrelevant, uh, right? Oh, yeah, it's a little hard to get exact numbers, but we just saw an article that says 2.36 TEVs in each direction. Okay, so in each direction. So it has two rings, right, that, you know, you go clockwise and counterclockwise, each one at 2.36 TEV, and they smash together. So the total then energy would be twice that, all right? It says that they'll eventually get to 14 TEV events, so seven tera electron volts in each direction. Um, well, how many joules is that then on a particle, would we say? Can we work it backwards? So, excellent. Energy on <laughs> one proton <laughs> with, let's say, 2.36 tera electron volts. Well, I'm sorry, that does not make sense. My bad. Because the amount of energy is that. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Sorry, I got distracted there. Um, you know what? I think that's good. This is a long video. I think we get the gist. Let's leave it there.